really needs to focus on joy. What is that? Where can we get that? How do I continue to tap into that? How can I give that to myself and yes. rewire my brain? We want a joyful brain. That's what we're <laughs> going yes. for. Yeah. <laughs> Hi there. Thank you so much for joining me. I'm Hecate, and this is Finding OK, a healing podcast for survivors of sexual assault and any and all abuse. Today, I'm joined by Denise Bossart. Denise is an award-winning writer, poet, photographer, and artist. She is a certified meditation facilitator and contemplative arts teacher. She is an IT professional working for a large urban school district. I had the pleasure of reading her beautiful book, Thriving After Sexual Abuse, Break Your Bondage to the Past, and Live a Life You Love. And we'll be talking about it today, as well as hearing a bit about Denise's healing journey. Trigger and content warnings for this episode include the following. Trauma, abuse, child abuse, sexual assault, family sexual abuse, eating disorders, and weight. Please check in with yourself and make sure you're all right to continue. Yeah, I completely adore the book and I'm really excited to to talk to you about it. I it, it blew me away and I'm really excited to um like that this is available for for people who are really raw, who are just starting their healing journey. Um, and I think like personally on my podcast, I think it's probably going to be my number one recommendation for people who are just beginning their healing journey Aww. because it's such an incredible, oh my gosh, the, um, especially the, the checklist that you gave for finding mm-hmm. a therapist. I'm going to use that. I've been <laughs> in therapy since I was in second grade and I was like, this is incredible. I'm a therapist. Where was this? Oh my gosh. (laughs) Yes. Like, where was this my whole life? It's an incredible resource. Um, and such an, such a great tool. There are so many, uh, just incredible resources and tools all throughout the book. And I'm just so excited that you've done this and, uh, and that we get to talk about it. So thank you for being here. Awesome. Yeah. So I'd like to begin. Are you okay? I'm doing great. It's uh, been a lovely weekend here in Houston and just enjoying the transition. We we have a, a light transition to winter. So, <laughs> you know, oh, we don't no. dip down into negative temperatures by any stretch of the imagination here. So it's been quite lovely to get out. And, and I, I teach a photography courses, contemplative photography courses, and I installed a student show today at a gallery and had people come by. Mm-hmm. It was just lovely to share that. Yeah, so I'd I'd love to hear a compliment that you've received and that you've never forgotten. I was thinking back. I'm not really good at accepting compliments, so it's hard sometimes to remember when you, when you've gotten them. <laughs> you know, you're like, oh yeah, thanks, whatever. Um, That's relatable. I, I, yeah, I did get one recently again in in teaching my photography classes. I had someone to say what a wonderful experience it was to be in my class because I gave them permission to be vulnerable and they felt safe to really explore what we were trying to do. And to me, that was really heart touching because that's my goal is when I teach, I want to make a container for folks that they can learn and explore and feel safe. And it just proved that I was as attaining what I had hoped to attain and really had impacted the students that way. So that was quite lovely. That's wonderful. Yeah, that's so important, especially uh when it comes to to creative expression and feeling safe enough to yeah to explore that to learn new things to express yourself yeah and what is your favorite color and what do you associate with it it's interesting that my favorite color has changed over time when i was a little girl it was yellow and i had a yellow room with a yellow bedspread you know the walls were yellow wow. But recently, I really come to love the color orange, which I never really had an affinity for earlier, but I've really fallen in love with it. And part of it is, I think I learned that it was the color of creativity and mm-hmm. in some frameworks. And I just think that it's it's so rich 
and it's complementary to such beautiful colors like purple and turquoise, you know, <laughs> it's not only on its own, but in relationship to other colors and how vibrant that can be. And so I really embraced orange recently uh, for its nice. creativity and vibrancy and, and its zeal and that it invokes when I, when I look at it or wear it. Nice. Yeah. It's always, it's always interesting when, um, when our affinity for for colors shift over time as we grow and change and, and as people i find that fascinating yeah and if i had to summon you in a ritual what five things would i need to place as offerings at each point of the pentacle on the floor so I've never been asked this type of question before. So it, it took me a little while to <laughs> kind of think through it. It's like, what would draw me in? So of course, the first thing top of mind was high quality chocolate, a diver or something, real mm-hmm. fancy chocolate, especially if it had nuts in it, even better. Um, a seashell that you could actually pick up and hear the, the sea in. I love the beach oh. and the sea and just how you feel with those just waves rolling in meditatively being there on the sunshine. So definitely a seashell, uh, a star lily, cause they are, oh my gosh, so beautiful. Their scent is so strong and lovely and they're beautiful. Oh, wow. So I love that. Sandalwood incense, love the smell of sandalwood. And then as a photographer, as a nature level lover, a postcard of a beautiful scene, maybe like the mountains reflecting in a lake or something very beautiful uh, nature scene on a postcard. So I think, I think those would draw me in. I love it. I love it. Do you have a favorite, um, a favorite Godiva chocolate? Probably something with hazelnuts or almonds, chocolate, dark chocolate. Nice. And here's nice. a funny story. I always loved light chocolate, milk chocolate, for the longest time when I was a kid, I hated dark chocolate. I think maybe that was because at one point in time, I accidentally grabbed some cooking chocolate thinking that was edible. You <laughs> and it, never forget it when you do that. <laughs> and so that to me was dark chocolate. I'm like, oh, I don't want any of that. But my husband was feeding my chocolate addiction. And for some reason, he got the idea in his head that I liked dark chocolate. And I just never had the heart to tell him that I didn't. And so eventually, because I, I just kept eating all this chocolate he kept giving me, I converted and now I'm a dark chocolate person. And of I course, now that. that I've learned how healthy that can be for you, I have the best excuse in the world to continue my, my dark chocolate passion and obsession. So <laughs> that's how I it that. arose. I, I love learning about the health benefits of dark chocolate. It makes me feel like, uh, I don't know, there's some kind of justice in the universe. <laughs> yeah, there's a balance there, you know, yeah. you it's great. <laughs> chocolate and the health benefits. (laughs) And I would love to hear three essentials to your self-care. Sure. Getting out in nature is absolutely key for me. There's something so nurturing, balancing, settling, just be able to find peace out in nature. Generally, if if it's not man-made nature, but just a, a garden, wild garden, or a walk in the woods, but even if it's a flower garden that I have to get to, that's more man-made. Any of that can be so rejuvenating for me. And then, of course, my body work practices, the, the yoga, the qigong, meditation, those kind of things are very, very important. And also can't go without the cat snuggles. That's <laughs> the final key ingredient to my self-care is just spending time with her. We have the most snuggly little kitty she just loves to curl up with you. And there's just something to say about being with an animal that just gives you that unconditional love and voluntarily comes to you to share in those kind of warm, loving, kind of uh, snuggly situations that that's the, I think the third piece of what I now see as my self-care. Yeah. Oh, it's so important. Do you have do you have like a favorite spot in nature? There are some spots that I really enjoy. Again, mostly I'm drawn to trees. I, I just somehow feel an affinity for trees. Um, mm. Mostly the the taller, big growth trees. There's a, a retreat center not far from where I live, about an hour away. That gets you out of the city, so you don't hear the noise. 
and it has the most incredible energy. As soon as you get out of your car, you just feel settled and it's so quiet. And so peaceful. And they have little trails through the woods. There's a little pond that you can sit by. There's a labyrinth there that you can walk. It's oh. just lovely. And I, I love to go there and kind of wander around and take a few pictures and just be in that energy. I, I've heard that they have literally blessed every acre <laughs> on that property. And you can feel it. You can feel that energy there is so encompassing. It's just like you so easy to lose yourself and be present and settle in and not have to worry about things. The worry just goes away and you can just be present. And one day I went and I, I don't know who was more surprised, me or the large otter that came scampering along the trail, Aww. getting into the water. It was oh, one of those, goodness. we looked at each other and the eyes got big and my <laughs> eyes got big. And, and then he went in, he or she went into the water and I'm scrambling for my cell phone. I got to take a picture. And of course <laughs> they were gone, but it was, Aww. you know, we, we don't get those moments of pure, natural interfacing <laughs> with animals yeah. like that in, in the city. And to have that, I mean, it was huge. It was like five, six feet long. And, wow. and and then, of course, it was bobbing up and down in the lake as it went away from me and chirping at me and letting me know <laughs> that it was not happy I was there. But I just was stunned, you know, and, and that's something I think modern humans really in the in the urban areas certainly don't have those experiences and they're so critical for us to be able to have that. It's not like going to the zoo and you see an animal in a cage. This is yeah. you're in their environment, <laughs> you know? So, so that, that place just has this wonderful atmosphere and there's these sacred places you can find all over the, all over the world. Right. And this happens to be in my backyard. I'm just really lucky I can go there. I'm so happy it's it's so close to you and that it gets to be that you have that as part of your life and mm -hmm. and it's it's always a good sign when it when an environment um you know like that that it can support wildlife like that um, mm -hmm. it's a great it's a great sign that the that the otters call it home as well it's, it's a good yeah there's a, there's a good balance there happening that that it's truly natural that we're yeah. not creating something. We're just letting something exist as it should and yeah. providing, the, again, providing the container for that to, to grow. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you so much for talking about that. I love, <laughs> I love hearing, um, cause I've, everybody's very different with the way that they connect to nature, like what part of nature uh, or what kind of environments like really feed them or nurture them or mm -hmm. what they're drawn to. And so I, I love hearing about that. And I, I loved that you talked about um, the importance of nature uh, in your book, because it's it's so true, and I I think it's starting to get talked about more uh, how important you know the the tie between nature and healing, um, mm -hmm. but it is it is still a conversation that is not being had enough. Um, so I love that you included that in your book. Um, yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, so I I would love to know uh, just a little bit about your your writing process and uh and how you knew that it was time to write your story and, uh, sure yeah. sure so I've always been somewhat of a writer when I was a little kid I wrote poems um just because I enjoyed expressing myself that way the mighty hunters have set out you know at Thanksgiving time and all <laughs> these silly little things that you do when you're a kid and your three-line note paper that we used to have back in the day um and I love writing short, short stories and you know, the, the book reports that everyone hated. I loved writing, reading and writing book reports. Um, and I did that throughout elementary school and high school and then kind of lost that a little bit in, in college. But um, I actually got back into writing because uh, as part of my healing process, I started writing poems about my abuse experience and how I felt what I sensed, what I was experiencing as the abuse happened as a child. And then I wrote poetry about my transition and my healing process. So it was kind of a, a journey that I went on in poetry. And at the time, my husband had told me, you should publish that. Those are, that would be really helpful to people to hear that. And I'm like, who's going to po publish poetry? <laughs> you know, back then before everyone was self-publishing, it's like, who's going to publish this? And and self-publishing wasn't an option back then. So I kind of put it aside and I actually got into writing some fiction. A friend of mine was doing some fiction work and I 
uh, wrote a, a novel that was um, actually based on my abuse experience. Kind of the subtext behind it was the the villain was my grandfather who was my abuser and the heroine was a younger, stronger version of me. And there are characters in there that represented very various people in my family. And and I really didn't know with that fiction novel that it was a, a, about my abuse until much later. My friend had said, pick someone you know who's a bad guy and turn them into your villain. I'm like, oh, I have a bad guy in my life, <laughs> you know, my abuser. But it didn't click to me until I actually finished the book that, that that was the role. The villain was my grandfather. I was a heroine. And it was a resolution to that abuse story that I never got because my grandfather died when I was in high school. So this mm-hmm. was a way that I was able to express that. And it was a real aha moment to be, have the book finished and be looking at it and going, oh my gosh, I just wrote about my abuse and, and overcoming it. And wow. so I, I, I still didn't feel at that point in time that I had a way to express my story. As a trauma survivor, I don't have a way to really put the memories of my abuse and into the timeline of my life outside of the abuse. It's just very hard to do that. So I didn't have a quote memoir that I could write about my story. And I I really wanted to share it to help people, but I thought I, I just don't have enough to, what is it gonna be five pages? <laughs> you know, well, what how helpful would that be? But then the story about Dr. Larry Nassar and the gymnast broke. And here were all these hundreds of girls and women that this one man had abused in front of their parents in the same room. And I my heart just broke. I was like. Yeah. These women need help to, you know, they need help to heal. It's horrible what happened to them. I know what they're going through. And then a, like a little light bulb went off saying, I could write that book. Yeah. I could write the book to help people heal. I can tell my experiences, share some of my story, but the main goal would be to give people the information and inspiration they need to start their healing journeys or continue on their healing journeys. And I can share the various things that I did that I put together because there was no blueprint. There was no guidebook to how to do it. When I started, I thought I could write the book. I wish I had had when I started my healing journey and put it together so that, you know, I, I, I'm a creative person, but a very analytical person kind of have both sides of the brain. I said, I can be creative and write about my story and my healing, but that, uh, organizational, critical minded side, I can put together some checklists for people and some questions that they could ask themselves that they could work on and make it kind of a a story workbook that they could use to help guide them through things, to give them inspiration, give them ideas. Now, I wasn't trying to set up a 21 day plan to healing. I was just like, hey, this is my story. This is what worked for me. Why don't you explore these things? Try to find things that work for yourself. I'm like, I can write that book. So that inspired me to begin writing. But the challenge for me was that when I wrote the fiction, it was on a schedule. I'll sit down, I'll write a chapter this weekend, and I'll edit it. But, you know, chunk, 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 the time was scheduled. I could do it. There was no problem. I tried to do that with my book about healing, and it blew up in my face. I had wow. such writer's block. Because it was just too much to try to do it on a schedule. And I got very frustrated and and I wanted to do it, but it was really hard. It was like another layer of healing that I was trying to do in writing it. And so I finally just said, you know what? The heck with the schedule. Let me just approach it any way I can. I can't start at the beginning and write to the end. It's too intense. Let me kind of put my story in detail aside. Let me, the first thing I did was I knew the structure I wanted to have about each of the ways that I had helped myself heal. So I decided, let me walk, walk through the checklist, the questions I want people to ask themselves. I'll start with that. That's pretty easy. And I'd skip around to the different parts of the book. And I said, okay, let me write about my story in relationship to each of those areas. So you mentioned nature. Let me talk about how nature was healing to me. And so I would fill in my story to that piece and got those done. And the very last thing I tackled was the full introduction that was the story of my abuse and my my recovery because it was the hardest. It was really hard to dip into that. And I wasn't afraid of sharing it, maybe a, a teeny little bit afraid of sharing it, but what I was afraid of was get doing it well enough that people could understand and relate and it could be helpful. 
you know, that's where the pressure was for me that I put on myself is I really want this to be written well and to be helpful. And even at the end, I, I would use that as an as inspiration to say you can do it because it's going to be helpful. And I just kind of let it go and just try to do it. So rather yeah. than start at the beginning to go to the end on a schedule, it turned out it was do what you can. And sometimes it's like, be honey, it's OK. You wrote one sentence this week. Good. You made progress. That's what we need. Yeah. You know, and it's like a healing journey in itself. Right. Because if you can take that one step forward, even if it's a baby step. It's going forward. And so it was a very, very different process. It took me two years to get through it and finish it. But, you know, I just gave myself permission to go slow and do what I needed to take care of myself, but continue to work to try to get this book put together in a way that would serve other survivors to help them. Yeah. But not be a detriment to you. Right. That's wonderful. Thank you so much for talking about that. I love hearing about, yeah, I love hearing about people's process. um, And especially because there's, there's so many um, survivors that have questions about that, like that are Mm -hmm. thinking about doing this, that are thinking about making writing their story or sharing their story uh, as, you know, a part of their, their journey. And um, yeah. And I love that you were so mindful about uh, self-regulation and not uh, not harming yourself and and being gentle with yourself uh, the the way that you organized it the way it needed to be organized uh, instead of yeah like hurt, you gotta stick to the schedule by trying to, yeah exactly yeah, <laughs> yeah. Just trying to trying to make it happen uh, you know in in the wrong way um, or the way that that wasn't gonna work for you yeah. And I didn't really tell people I was writing it because I didn't want that pressure of people asking me, is it done yet? You know, how far are you? And my husband knew about it. Of course, he always supported me. He, He never pushed me. He, you know, just gave me the space to do what I needed to do. And so eventually I did share with people that I was going to start writing it. And especially when I got an editor and was getting some professional help with that. And then I started posting about it on social media. It was like the first time it's like, okay this is going to be real click, <laughs> you know, it's like, it's out there now, you know, and, but then yeah. it, it, that I saw as part of my process of healing and being willing to be authentic and be present and say, this is who I am. I'm not ashamed of it. Bad things happen to me, but I'm working to make myself a better person beyond what could have defined me. And here, here's what I've been through. And you know, I, I felt okay doing that because it wasn't a, a finger pointing book. It wasn't a book about what that person that had hurt me. It was about going forward, you know, going forward and healing and what we could do to, to support each other in healing. Um, and it's interesting because, you know, I get, if I post on social media and I get feedback from people like at work, it, it feels like my worlds are two separate places, you know, but someone from work will like a post that I had. I'm like, oh, Okay, they know that that book is out there, but okay, they know. You know, it it sometimes is like a little jarring because sometimes I feel like those worlds are really separate. But it, at the same time, it's nice that the people are recognizing it throughout my connections in the world. You know, family, friends, and work that people are are aware yeah. of it because that's that's just part of who I am. Um, and I'm perfectly happy to talk about it if anyone wanted to come up to me. And I did have someone come up to me recently at work because. She had a situation that could look like it might be an abuse situation. And she says, I know that you know about this, so I want your input on it. And I was like, oh, wow. Okay. Wow. So this opened okay. the door for her to feel comfortable to come forward and, and get some help, some advice about that. So I was like, hey, you know, if that, yeah. that opens some doors for people to have, feel comfortable and, and doing that, then that's, that's great that that's part of what's going on with this book. Well, and thank goodness. I mean, so much better than how things were before, which was just, you know, the stigma and the silence and no one's talking about it. So no one has anyone to go to or, yeah, even like even just someone to go to and they say, here's a resource. Mm-hmm. It just, um, yeah, just, just this unspoken thing. And that's, that- that's the killer, I think, for survivors is the shame. You know, yeah. it's so hard to internally for yourself face what's happened to you. A lot of times we dissociate, we find ways of shoving it down. We 
find ways to numb ourselves, to forget what's going to have happened to us. There's so many coping mechanisms that we have because it's just overwhelming. And then we're afraid of that rejection when you feel like you are to a point you need to share, whether it's sharing it to get help in the immediate situation or afterwards to get help to recover from the situation. Um, it's really daunting to say, I'm going to tell someone. The, the, the first time I ever, outside of my my husband, really told uh, someone was when I had to pick up the phone and call my insurance company to say, I need help finding someone who specializes in abuse. And that was the first time those words kind of came out to a stranger, someone outside of my my known trust area. And that was huge. That was terrifying and huge, but it got me on the road to where I needed to be. But that's really hard to take those steps if you're feeling like people are going to respond negatively to you. They're going to reject you either um, directly, explicitly by denying and, and invalidating your experience. And, and most people don't really realize it's, it's hard to hear someone's story when something horrible like that's happened. But people who share their stories, a lot of times they just need validation. They just need yeah. you to accept that what I'm telling you is my true experience. And yeah. then maybe we can go from there to the next step, which would be, can you support me in getting me some help that I need to, to move forward? But it, it's hard. It's really hard to do that first step. Yeah. Well, and yeah, that, that validation, like being heard, receiving validation and not receiving judgment or shame, mm-hmm. which, um, which is, you know, sadly plentiful, you know, not, not only in ourselves, but unfortunately does exist from others, um, or society at large at, at times. Um, yeah. And we can face and that in our immediate situations because people want to deny it because they don't want to deal with it. They exactly. don't want to admit what's happening because they don't want to change the family structures or the dynamics of what's happening. There's a lot of reasons why people would deny, you know, I had some yeah. denials when I was a child and it, it's just something that we fear happening, but it shouldn't keep you from continuing to look for what you need, you know, cause you know, your experience is true. And and you need to find someone who can validate that. That's why I'm really a strong proponent of if you can possibly do it, your situation allows you to get some help from a professional who's been trained in dealing with trauma. We've come a long way from just being able to have general therapists to people who understand these kind of abuse and trauma situations and are specifically trained to help deal with those kind of things for people. And so, and especially during this age where you can do telehealth, you can get on a a call with someone and you don't have to have that expert in your hometown. You can find that expert in a network. Um, So it's, it's a wonderful time, I think, for people who need help to be able to find the help they need. It it does take a little effort to to do that. And, you know, I try to help people figure that out in my book, um, how to, how to find the therapist you need and what questions to ask them. But I think it's a wonderful time to give an opportunity for more people to connect with the help that they need without having to, to you know, be able to drive there, being able to um, find the person locally. And it's wonderful to have those kind of resources now. Yeah. The accessibility uh, has just exploded, um, especially during the pandemic. And, you know, and I, I love like not not just for location, but also um, for, uh, you know, various like disability issues that mm-hmm. someone might be facing if they if they can't travel, something like that. Maybe you suffer with uh, agoraphobia. All mm-hmm. of a sudden, like you're you're able to receive treatment without having to exit your home if that's a problem for you. There's just so many angles um, to it. And yeah, the, the, the treatment that people need that it's now available uh, on, I mean, just a level that is unprecedented. Mm -hmm. Uh, It's Mm -hmm. very exciting. And I think, um, yeah, I'm just, um, oh, I'm very happy about that. And I have, I have friends who are receiving treatment that um, were never able to receive treatment before. Um, Mm -hmm. And I'm just really, really excited about that. So are they, so are Mm -hmm. they. What is your story, and uh, and how did you how did you tell people for the first time and get help? So uh, my abuse started when I was very young. Uh, again, I I can't tell you exactly when it started because of the the trauma brain, but 
I know based on the experiences I was having and the types of use that was happening, um, and I knew my relative size to people, and so I was a very small little person, um, elementary school for sure, and that continued till my grandfather died when I was 15, freshman in high school. I don't know how much longer it would have continued if he hadn't died of prostate cancer, karma, um, but that was a pretty long time, and I think I... The way I remember it, I, I mentioned something to my sister when we were very little, and I remember her going to tell my mother and coming back and saying, yeah, mom says that's not true. And so I was already feeling like what was happening was definitely not right. It felt icky to a little girl. It just didn't feel right. I, it, it just didn't make sense to me. And that was kind of the first barrier that I had placed in front of me about getting help. Um, and I learned to associate physically. I learned to sort of push down the memories so I wouldn't remember it in between. It was usually when we were dropped off for summer vacation and would spend that with my grandparents on their house on the lake. So here's this idyllic situation. There's boating and skiing and fishing and swimming and grandma cooking homemade meals and abuse. Um, he went after a particular type of personality and there were several generations in my family that there were women that he went after, multiple women. And, you know, the real creative, bright women that he was drawn to. Um, I actually think that he was abused. I think it was a cycle in our family. And I think he was abused. And But I, he probably would have been diagnosed as a narcissist in our mm -hmm. current languaging and understanding of personality types. Very domineering, very controlling, very manipulative, very sharp person. And absolutely terrifying to a little girl to have this six foot something guy, ex-military man. Um, and I don't remember him ever saying what would happen, but it certainly, there was an atmosphere of secrecy of where it happened, when it happened. And he was so imposing personality wise and physically to me that I, I knew that you don't cross this path. Um, so I pretty early on learned to keep my mouth shut and live in perfect misery <laughs> for, and I just, I didn't know how I was going to get help. I didn't know how I was going to make it stop. I my brain kind of released all of that pressure because I would have this reoccurring nightmare of a monster coming through this dark hole in my wall of my bedroom to come get me, you know, symbolism there. Um, but other than that, I just, I just would repress it and, until he died. And then I guess my brain said, aha, there's no one here to threaten you. You're, we're going to let you remember everything. And it's just, phew, uh, just all these body memories, all these sort of, visual flashbacks. Um, it was just overwhelming. And here I am in high school, all the hormones are already going. I want to be attractive. I want to attract male attention. And here is this whole total maelstrom of shame and negativity and lack of self-worth. And, you know, what he, my grandfather taught me was I was worthless. I was unlovable. I was worthless. It, I, it was a shameful thing. I deserved what I was getting. And that voice even though he was dead, that voice was in my head, you know, and, and telling me I had internalized that voice. And to counter that, I kind of turned into a perfectionist. Some, some way of getting control of my life was to be a perfectionist at school and to do really well in school because I got a lot of positive feedback from that. So I had no way to get help. I was ashamed to ask for help. I had kind of learned that you better just not ask. You're not going to get supported. And so I immersed myself in school and band and basketball and kept my brain busy. That was my coping mechanism. Pour everything into school, get a lot of good feedback for getting good grades, make yourself feel good about getting good grades. And I did love to learn. I love to learn. It was just this extra piece on it. And so that went on until I got into college and I started dating a graduate student. And I had told a couple of boyfriends in high school a little bit about it, but not much. Um, but I really opened up to this this graduate student. He was a recovering alcoholic, and he went to 12-step programs, Alcoholics Anonymous. And so he was very much aware of how getting that help would benefit me. So he got me to go to the counseling center and took me a couple of tries, but I found a counselor at school that was working for me. And then I got into a 12-step program, Survivors of Incest Anonymous, which was Incredible. My, my therapist helped me get into a women's group of people who had been abused or assaulted, raped, et cetera. It was a, and so that was my first chance to really be in front of 
other women and hear their stories. Cause I, you know, you always think you're, it's just you in a way, you know, that no one's had your experience. No one can understand what you're going through, but here was this group of women. Yeah. Yeah. It's just really sad that how isolated we can feel, but here was this group of women. And what was great for me is there were some that were pretty far along in their healing journey. And I could actually see where I could be if I worked like they did. It's very inspiring. And then when the Survivors of Incest Anonymous, there were people of all ages and there were men. It was a mixed group. There was this young man who was a model and gorgeous and had a horrible abusive childhood. And here was a man that age of my grandfather when my grandfather abused me and his mother had abused him. And that just flipped my brain on its side. It's like, oh, they're all not dirty old men. There's actually something other than that, you know, and here's this poor man that had been abused by his mother and was still suffering and trying to find his way. So all of these things really were what got me started in college to start the process of healing and and doing sort of more of the traditional therapy-based, group-based approaches. But eventually I kind of went my my own way to find additional things that would support me. Yeah. I have never had an experience um, specific to uh, the the sexual trauma that I've had. I've never had like a, a, a group therapy experience um, that was specific to that. And I loved uh, reading about how helpful that was to you because I think especially like seeking therapy is, uh, I mean, for people who are new to it, it's intimidating even to look for, uh, for an individual therapist. Mm-hmm. And I think groups are seeking group therapy is this is even more so intimidating. Mm -hmm. And so I loved how positive your experience was and how inspiring it was. Mm -hmm. Um, And that you talked about uh, being able to meet someone who was like a healing role model, like someone, Mm -hmm. you know, I I could, I could be that I could be where you are. I just have to keep going. Mm -hmm. Uh, being, Mm -hmm. Being able to, to actually meet somebody um, who had a shared experience and, and who's, you know, like, look, they're doing it. <laughs> and yeah. it's just, uh, it can be done. They're not um, miserable in their life. They're actually finding some happiness and joy, which I, yes. I was like, what is that? What, what are you talking about? <laughs> what? Yeah. I, oh, it's, it's so important. It's so important. What has been your experience um, since then moving forward with therapy? What, uh, what role has therapy played in, in your healing um, since then? Yeah, I, I did the therapy in college until I went to grad school. And then I kind of felt like I had reached sort of a plateau where I was pretty okay with it. And then grad school just, again, was sucked back into academia and doing well in school and working 80 hours a week between schoolwork in the lab and getting my, my degree. And so I kind of put self-care and self-healing on pause. I did a few things uh, sports-wise, club sports teams and things. But other than that, again, it was kind of a plateau and a pause. But once I got out of graduate school, you know, I realized that I needed to do some more healing. And so I felt like I had gotten as far as I could with with the therapy for, for then. I eventually went back into therapy when my husband and I got engaged and I wanted to make sure that I was going to be in a good place mentally, physically, emotionally about getting into this long-term relationship. But then I I started to explore other things and I decided that um, we heard that if you want to have kids, yoga is a good thing to do while you're pregnant. So I'm like, okay, if we want to get pregnant, let me back that up a few months or so and start doing yoga then. (laughs) So, you know, my planning brain came in like, let me try yoga. So it was really about anticipating having a family and not really something to focus on for my own healing, but it was amazing that uh, the universe was guiding me to the right place that was needed for me. And I found a wonderful studio. I actually started working with male teachers because that's who was teaching the introductory courses. And it was intimidating at first because there was a lot of poses that I was uncomfortable with. I felt very exposed in, and I didn't want to stand out by not doing them, but I was uncomfortable. And I, I eventually talked to the teacher and not surprising based on all the statistics we have, but his sister had been sexually abused. And so he got it. He understood. We talked about how I could do things differently for some of the poses. He went 
you know, make adjustments for me because uh, that was, you know, didn't want really want to be touched. And, you know, he wouldn't call out anything about what I was doing differently so that I'd feel comfortable with class. And eventually going through the practice, it really allowed me to get back in touch with my body because I had, like I said, learned to dissociate and I actually had grown to hate my body because my body was part of this whole thing with my grandfather and I just learned to hate it and despise it. And ugh, it was just, I didn't want to have anything to do with it, but mm -hmm. yoga got me back into my body, got me to learn to accept my body, see my body as this beautiful, supportive thing and totally transform my, my own body imagery uh, and my connection with my body. And to the point I learned to love the yoga because of the the strength, the flexibility, the physicality part, but also it was helping me move into more spiritual uh, engagement and practices like meditation, which was the next thing I kind of connected with. But I thought I, that's why in my book I talk about body practices because I think that's very important for survivors to really learn to connect with their body, learn to be at home in their body because it's your body. What happened to you kind of stole that stole your body from you and this is a finding a way to reclaim your body and inhabit it and to fully enjoy it as the gift that it is for us that takes some some tremendous amount of healing and whatever way that you connect if it's running rollerblading dancing <laughs> whatever it is that can get you embodied i think that's yeah. a real critical part of healing that all of us need to try to explore it is. And I, I loved how, how much of just this, this core part of your book was your, how embodied your healing process was. Um, and it's honestly, mine is not so much. I still very much struggle with, um, with that, uh, being, being in your own body, being comfortable with that. Um, and I, I very I really loved you talking about yoga specifically um cuz I I very much related to that and uh uh yeah and I love that trauma informed yoga practices are becoming so much mm -hmm. uh more common uh and you know easy to find in certain areas um so that's something if you're interested in starting yoga you can look for trauma informed practices um and you know if you talk to your yoga instructor asking them that is definitely something you should do uh it can definitely help because yeah yoga can be um very activating uh mm -hmm. when you're when you're getting getting into it and i've I've had a lot of experiences like that. There's nothing like uh, being in a yoga class and all of a sudden you you try a pose and it's like, oh, that shook something loose in me. And yeah, now mm -hmm. we're now we're crying upside down. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> it's just yeah, but uh, but yeah, so so incredibly healing um, to to be present in your own body is such a oh, it is such a struggle after uh, experiencing specifically sexual trauma. Um, mm -hmm. and it is, I mean, it's essential. You are a, you are a person in your in flesh body. Shoot. <laughs> and, and you, ha you got to stay into it until you got to leave. And that's, you know, that's, that's life. And, uh, and I think it's all part of learning to, to like ourselves and love ourselves again. You know, I was mm -hmm. taught to hate myself, to despise myself, to be ashamed of myself. And, for me to reclaim all aspects of who I am, my body is one of those things that I want to reclaim to be part of what I like about myself. And we all come in different shapes and sizes and that's okay. And whatever yours is, as long as you're being healthy with it, <laughs> you know, treating yeah. it well, it's okay. Um, God made us unique. The universe, goddess, who, however you want to describe it, we show up as unique expressions and, I think that we can work hard. You know, society has to try to push us, and the Western society has tried to push us into a certain idea of what a body should be and how you should use your body. And, but we need to figure that out for ourselves. I'm a real proponent of figure out what works for you. Mm -hmm. What works for you is what you're going to do, is what you're going to absorb, is what you're going to make a habit. And that's what you need to figure out. Don't let somebody else tell you 
what it should be for you. They might give you examples like me in my book and say, hey, try this out, think about this. But in the end, it's an exploration of homecoming to yourself. And what does that mean for you? What is it that makes your body feel good? Is it a hot bath? Is it taking a run? Is it walking in the quiet woods? Is it snuggling up with your pet? Whatever that is, can you do more of it? We know so much more about neuroscience now, and we know our brains learn and grow all the time. There's no end point to building those new connections in your brain. You can literally Mm -hmm. rewire your brain through what you experience and do and what you focus on. If you can focus on absorbing all these wonderful, positive, healing, healthy experiences, if you can give that to yourself and immerse yourself, marinate yourself in those as they show up, little by little, you're going to literally rewire your brain so it focuses on the positive, it sees the positive, it finds the positive, it brings it back into your life. And it's this positive, virtuous cycle that you can literally use what we know from Western science and what you might be exploring in non-Western science, like yoga or meditation, you can bring that together and really have a healing that you can actively engage in and you can see the results in over time. Yeah. The gift of neuroplasticity. <laughs> Hallelujah. Beautiful thing. Yes, yes. Thank, <laughs> oh my gosh. Thank oh, oh, if it weren't for that, uh, we'd just be a mess. But um, yeah, I, I loved, you touched on something else in your book and it was uh, food and control. Mm-hmm. And uh, and the experience of disordered eating, and uh, <laughs> I also relate to that. Mm-hmm. Um, so I was hoping that we could talk about that for uh, for a minute. Yeah, it's it's you know when you feel so out of control and you feel someone else has control over your body, either because it was it's ongoing or you're tied to what had happened to you. That's mm-hmm. one of the places we we try to to control yeah. our lives is through eating and. For me, um, I teetered on the edge of anorexia. I mean, I was very controlling about what I ate and, you know, would push myself as far as I could to see how little I could eat for how long I could last without eating. And my mom was busy with her own business. So a lot of times we were, you know, I was in various activities. I wouldn't be home for dinner. And and I I probably lived on spaghetti, (laughs) you know, that was because it was easy to make and fast to make. And, you know, I could get to studying, but. I would. I, I would push to the point of, you know, low sugar levels. You better get something to eat or you're going to pass out. And I think what kept me from going over the edge into full-blown anorexia was two things. One is I wanted my brain to function well enough to do well in school because that was a real positive feedback for me. I couldn't tip it so far that I couldn't mentally do what I needed to do. And I was in sports. I needed to be healthy enough to be able to play because I loved playing basketball and was on a team and accepted for who I was. It was a very empowering and nurturing space for me. They knew nothing about my abuse. They just knew I was good at sports and I was accepted for that. And that was really important to me. And, you know, I, I was like 110 pounds, five foot 10, skinny as a rail. And, and my coach actually asked my mom to try to bolt me up because <laughs> I was, I was a sinner and here was, I was tossed around this skinny kid. And then we went to the the doctor and the the doctor said, yeah, okay, if you want to gain weight, you need to have a 3,500 calorie a day. And I was like, what does that mean? How much do I have to eat? And he told me, I'm like, are you crazy? You know, there's no way I would eat that much food. Um, But I I did. And and back then, again, I I am the age that I am. So I say back then a lot for you younger folks on the the call, but (laughs) they didn't know as as much about eating disorders then. But um, yeah, it, it was a, a cutting edge for me. And once I got into therapy with the therapist, I think it started easing a little bit, but I think it was the yoga that finally let me release the need for controlling my body, mm-hmm. that I, I didn't need to control my body because I was trying to learn to be a partner with my body and, mm-hmm. you know, would hear about eating well and and taking care of your body in this yoga community and started to realize that there was another way that I could find um, an easefulness in my body that didn't demand that I try to control the food and things around the food. And so I could release that. I could let go of that a little bit over time. Yeah, I love that. I love that 
uh, that practice led to not only, uh, yeah, in inhabiting, uh, your body, but that that led to, um, to acceptance and respect of, of your body as well, that, that, the, that, that was a natural progression. Um, yeah. Yeah. And there wasn't this aspect of punishment, you know, there's an aspect of control about the eating, but there's an aspect of punishment that I may not even consciously know why I wanted to punish my body. Obviously now looking back, I can see what it was, but there was some aspect of punishment with mixed with the control, kind of the sick kind of thing happening. And with yeah. the yoga and, and the therapy and meditation, it's like, I don't have to feel the need to punish myself because it wasn't my fault. Yeah. Something bad happened to me. I need to try to recover from that, but I don't need to punish myself because it wasn't my fault. I had no way of stopping it. I was elementary school, short little kid, tall yeah. adult. He should have known better. He should have done better. And yeah. when I started to get to a point where some little piece of me said it wasn't my fault, I didn't fully accept that for a long time, but some part of me, enough of me was like, I don't have to punish myself anymore. I just need to put that energy into healing rather than punishing. Yeah. I loved the section on forgiveness <laughs> because it is such a loaded, like, ooh, mm. it is in survivor circles. Um, the whole conversation around forgiveness is mm -hmm. um, the, the way it's handled is, is honestly a pet peeve for me. Um, mm -hmm. Like I'll go off. <laughs> Um, yeah, you just uh, say that word and then you know, it's an explosion. Yeah, just it's I'm just sure your, table flip. Your um, listeners are like, she talks about forgiveness? What? It's like, well, hold yeah. on, time out. Let's tell you just, how I wait, talk wait, about wait, wait, it. Wait. <laughs> it's not what you think. Um yeah. yeah, and it's uh so so often as soon as as soon as that word is said, um, and there are so many people who specifically say uh, their message is, oh, in order to heal, you have to forgive mm -hmm. your abuser mm -hmm. uh, and that that has to be a part of um, of healing and moving on. And yeah, it's a prerequisite. You have to you have to pass that gate in order to even get anywhere. Yeah, it is. Yeah. It is a gatekeeping thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and I am not OK with that. Uh, if it is for you, fine. But I'm I'm tired of that being. um being stated as like a fact, uh, it is, I loved your section on forgiveness because it did not have that message or that vibe at all. And the most incredible, um, you know, like the, the most important part of that chapter in your book is forgiveness of self. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think that, that is something that resonates uh, for for me personally, and that's something that I would say um, is actually a pretty like that a is real the true gate. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. That, that's that, a true yeah. Gate. In order to heal, you do have to forgive yourself because mm -hmm. it was not your fault, uh, mm -hmm. and that that is uh, something that you actually do have to do. Um, yeah, I was told that myself, and unfortunately, it was the yoga teacher who was so supportive and helped me get into yoga and get deeper into yoga, he was one that actually, even as wise as he was in certain ways and as compassionate and generous as he was, he was one who emphatically told me over and over again, I had to forgive my grandfather. Pissed me mm. off. Pissed me off and disappointed me that he would say this, you know, because you see people and you kind of see them one dimensionally often. I'm like, oh, he's this, you know, perfectly wonderful person. And then he, he would say this to me. Yeah. And I was like, that it's is not okay. BS. <laughs> and you know, it just puts all the burden on us. And it's like, it, it, no, the, the only, the thing that I realized was it, and I said, it took me a long time that it wasn't my fault and that I had to let that go. I had to let go of the shame of thinking that somehow I was responsible because there was always this thing, you know, as kids, this, you know, you talk to psychologists and there's the way that children's minds deal with these situations that they are out of control. They have no way to stop something. Somehow they twist it around and make it that they 
are the ones that caused it. Again, it's maybe an aspect of control. It's an aspect of dealing with an untenable situation, but that is the pattern that human children do. So if this happened to you, you are being totally human and natural. That's how little children's brains work because it doesn't function properly as an adult till you're at least 20 something, right? We know that. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, and it, I had this vision in my head that came to me because I was so tired of spending all my energy fighting and, and pretty, trying to hold the abuse memories at bay and all the negativity that was coming up. I had this imagery of my grandfather was like this ball and chain and it was heavy and I couldn't get away from it. And it kept dragging. And when am I going to get free from this? And I was in misery and, and another light bulb went off and it was like, tink, the chain open and the weight was gone. And I was like, could it really be that easy in a way for me to simply say, no, I'm not going to focus on the past. I'm not going to be tied to you and what happened to me. I'm not going to put all my energy in trying to forget or block or whatever. I'm going to just let that go. I'm not forgiving him. I'm turning my energy away from being a victim and turning myself into a survivor and eventually a thriver because I'm putting the energy into me. I'm not defining myself as the person he abused. I am now defining myself as a person who has overcome or is overcoming a horrible situation. And I'm becoming the person that I want to be. And to me, that was the step of forgiving myself that I had no responsibility for that. And that's on my book. You see the cover of my book. I've got a ball and chain that's broken open and there's a rose growing up through that. And that rose to me, that red rose to me, means beauty, finding your own beauty. It smells beautiful. <laughs> you know, it's a, the color of it, the scent of it. It's this beautiful flower, but purposely the rose because it has thorns. And I'm mm. not going to be someone that's going to just lay down and let people walk over me. I'm going to be my true authentic self and I'm going to have good boundaries and I'm going to be a healthy person. So that imagery was very purposeful and came out of that experience of saying, I can just stop being the victim. I can transition and focus, give myself forgiveness for something I had no control over. Now, I also had to forgive the coping mechanism, mechanisms I had developed to try to deal with what was happening while it was happening and then yeah. the after effects. We all have behaviors that we did because we were trying to deal with all kinds of crap that was going on in our heads and in our bodies. Yeah. And we did things, whether we medicated, we, we, our relationships, whatever we did that weren't healthy, I had to look at those and go, okay, I don't like what I was doing or who I was, but I have to forgive that too, because I understand now I didn't know better. And yeah. now I'm going to learn to know better. I'm going to let go of the fact that that stuff happened, make amends where I need to make amends to myself and others and look to where I can become a better person. And there's so much you have to be able to say, that's in the past, let me learn from it, but let it not define who I'm going to be. Mm -hmm. Oh, yes. Thank you so much for talking about that. And I, yeah, especially the, um, the coping mechanisms, because we do, especially, especially if we were abused as children, you do you use the tools that you have available to you, which are extremely limited. If you're mm -hmm. a child, uh, you do the best that you can and you do, you have to, to let it go and not hold yourself responsible and just say, Hey, that's okay. I did. I did what I could and now I can do better. And a part of that is not punishing myself or feeling shame for the rest of my life over ultimately doing the best you could with a lack of resources and uh, and a horrific situation that was not your fault and, you know, should, in the end, you know, usually lies at the, the door of an adult who should have known better. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Um, who, should, who should have acted right. Um, you know, and you, and you talked about that as well, like put, put the blame where it belongs and shift that off of yourself and uh and let that go and that's it's incredibly important and difficult and uh 
and profound, uh, it's a profound shift in, in your healing process when you do finally reach that point, uh, that shift that you're talking about of like no longer staying in that mindset of, you know, being a victim, being at that point in time, um, you know, being under their power and having your focus there. Um, I've always thought of it as like still being in the room. Mm-hmm. Um, and, uh, you know, in flashbacks are a thing you may, you may return there. Your brain may, you know, kind of boot you back there every, every so often, but, um, but changing your mindset so that you are not living in the, in the room mm-hmm. or voluntarily. Or it, yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, you know, wh- whatever it may be for you, maybe it wasn't a room, but you know, um, if you're listening, um, you know, and I think that we don't give ourselves the kindness, the self-compassion that we deserve. And I, you know, I, I always am constantly trying to improve myself, listen to podcasts, learn what I can. And what's really struck me recently is how would you treat a friend? If you had a friend come to you and said, this is my story, would you shame, blame, treat them like crap? No, you would be so kind hearted and supportive. And how can I help you? And that I'm so sorry that happened to you. I can see how much that has hurt you. What can I do to support you? You would do all these things for your best friend that we can't seem to do for ourselves. And part of that is we're caught in that shame, blame, mild storm. But if we can just think, how would I treat someone else who was my best friend? How would my best friend treat me if they really understood the situation? Can't I do that for myself? Can I at least try to say, I'm going to try to be kind to myself today? Maybe that's where you start. If if you've got so much going on, can you say, can I try to be kind to myself in my words that I say to myself? Can I do some small kindness? Um, You know, I love orange juice. I'm just crazy, making it up crazy. I love orange juice (laughs) for breakfast in the morning. Let me do that every day. I love hot baths. Let me do that. Maybe add some bubble bath, you know, really treat myself. The smallest Mm -hmm. things that you can do. I really enjoy taking a walk, whatever it is. That's not a medicating type of behavior, a you know, yeah. coping mechanism, but a, a healing, uh, self-supporting kind of thing. Even the smallest things, like for me, it's like, hey, another bite of Godiva with chocolate. Just one bite today is going to get me to the point that I need. And not with guilty pleasure, but simply, I deserve to be kind to myself. And this is what I'm going to do to learn to be kind and to do yeah. my self healing and have my self compassion because it has you have to learn that i mean we were taught all the wrong ways to do things so yeah. with that neuroplasticity wonder that we have in our brain let's just try to be kind to ourselves and for me i had so much negative language i had so much negative language i talked out loud and put myself down to a point my friends were commenting on it in high school again when he died all this came out and my friends noticed it and they were kind to support me to get away from verbally bashing myself out loud. And then slowly I learned not to do that. And if you can just change the messaging you're giving yourself inside your head to say, that's okay. Thank you. I appreciate that you want to keep me safe, but I want to hear another voice now. And it's going to be the voice of kindness and just try to listen to that to start shifting things. Yeah. If you can learn to be your own best friend, mm-hmm. that will help your healing tremendously. Yeah. I think negative self-talk is um, is a huge obstacle uh, for all of us. And I love that you address that in your book. And it is, oh, yeah, that, that inner voice and shifting it, um, it is such a process and it, it is, it is so incredibly important. Um, it's it's a journey. (laughs) Yeah. And I I think, you know, it may sound to your listeners like, Oh God, they want me to do this and they want me to do that. And they got this whole list of things they want me to do. It's like, try one thing, try something that is easy for you that resonates. And I don't think our healing journey ever ends. I think that we reach, it's kind of like a spiral, you know, and sometimes things come back, but each time that things come back into our lives that are challenging, we've gained resilience. We've gained skills. We've gained the ability through our work to handle that differently. And we can look back and see. That's why journaling is so fantastic because you can look back and see where you were three months ago and go, oh my gosh, yeah. a couple of time. I thought I took two steps. I've taken 20. That's amazing. Um, but I think you just have to realize that 
it, it's not getting on the Audubon and zooming down to healing 200 miles an hour. It's going to be a slow process, but there are going to be rewards along the way that will support you. And you'll see that your life changing and improving. And I like the idea that I can keep becoming a better human being. In my mind, that's what human beings are here for on this planet is to learn, to explore, to grow. Now, we've yeah. gotten sort of a kick in the teeth. And so we have this huge plateau to get over to get to the point we can get on that more, quote, normal healing journey. So we've got a little more effort to put in to get to a, the starting gate, so to speak. But if we can do that work, then we can get to a point where healing and learning and growing is just a natural part of what we do because we love ourselves and we want to be the best that we can be. And we want to keep learning how to do that. So the first yeah. part of the journey is, can you get to the point where you like yourself, you have good behavior patterns, you're happy with how you're living your life for the most part. And then from there, you can go on a different type of healing journey that's going to keep extending your human potential. And so when people may read something that I wrote, that's like, a, you know, it's continuing healing journey. I think there's kind of these two stages that you get beyond the past and then you look to the future and, and the open, endless possibilities of where you could go with whatever you're trying to do. Yeah. And it's if, if somebody's listening and you're right at the beginning and you're really, really raw, all of that might seem like pie in the sky. It is totally possible. And it's so beautiful and exciting. And you have that. You have that to look forward to and to, to work towards. And you got this. You got this. And it's it's a beautiful life and it's yours and uh and it it gets better and it it just you gotta do the work one step at a time, whatever your pace is, and you have a beautiful life and you one hundred percent deserve that. And oh my gosh, and this <laughs> I'm like, I, I just got really excited and like inspired when you were saying that. So I, I just can't, I keep thinking about like that person that you talked about in group that was inspiring um, mm -hmm. to you. And I am so excited uh, for some of my listeners to have you be that person for them <laughs> to be like, I could do this. I'm so excited. I could do this. You can. Yeah. I, you can hear me. I get passionate about it because I want yeah. people to know I, I, was so stuck in a place, especially when I didn't have any resources, that didn't know where to start, and you know, you just feel kind of alone and helpless, but you're not. Whoever's listening, you're not alone, and there's people who are there to help you and make connections to what you need, whatever it is you need to heal, and just do the work little bit by little, and just yeah. really appreciate when things start to shift, no matter how small and accept that as a huge victory because you deserve to have whatever you want in your life. You deserve yeah. that. And you can work towards that. And you may just feel there's no thing in my world beyond the pain and suffering, but a little bit of work, you crack open a window, the sunshine and the air start flowing, and then you're going to start feeling that, that, and just, I just, you know, it's not, your fault, what happened, and you deserve the best for yourself. And you can work towards that and you have support and you have resources to help you get there. Yeah. I would love to uh, ask you about your meditation practice. Okay. Uh, and just uh, what what place that holds in in your life. I started off fairly simple because um, I, it seemed a little overwhelming to jump into it, and there weren't a lot of resources in the area where I was that I could connect with. So I actually started with guided meditations. Thich Nhat Hanh is a beautiful person to, to listen to his talks. He's so gentle and so kind. And I listened to his inspiring meditation talks. Um, John Kabat-Zinn, I listened to his um, I've gotten a lot out of Tara Brock and Jack Cornfield, some of these long, long-term Buddhist meditation practitioners, and just listening to the guided meditations because there was so much going on in my body and my head that I just couldn't do a silent meditation. 
And so I needed someone's voice to guide me through. And that was what got me started in the meditation practice. And then we moved to Atlanta around that point in time. And there was a Buddhist meditation center that I started attending because I wanted to get meditation instruction in a group experience and got instructed. And it was basically working with your breath, following your breath and just trying to be present in your body, following your breath. I was fortunate that I had spent a number of years doing yoga because one, it that's really what yoga was developed for was to get your body prepared to sit long times in meditation. That, that was mm. its original purpose. So I had the body uh, flexibility and strength and, and to do this, the seated meditation, but I also had that ex- experience with yoga to help settle my mind quite a bit. So I got to a place where the meditation wasn't as challenging for me physically or mentally, but some people it is very hard when you first start sitting to not have your brain go crazy because you're used to the distraction of the phone, the television, your, you know, your various tablets mm-hmm. and things that are constantly in our face. And we don't realize how much is really going on in our head <laughs> because you're so busy focusing outward. And when you put those devices aside and you sit down and you try to be quiet, a lot of people say, oh, my gosh, I, it just got louder. What, what I, why would I want to do this? Well, yeah. you're just realizing what's going on the, all the time. And eventually, if, if you do meditation practice, it's like taking a, um, a glass and you have dirt dropped into it and you stir it up a lot, stir it up a lot, and there's all this mess happening. And eventually, given time and stillness, it all settles down and there's mm-hmm. clarity. Now, it doesn't happen overnight, obviously. And it's not something that you're going to be the perfect meditation person if you do X number of hours. Every moment that you sit down and try to do meditation, it's going to be different for you. Every day could be different depending on what's going on. But for me, it's even if you can do one minute a day or five minutes, whatever you can do, whatever you can do it, the morning's a good time, the evening, at lunch, whatever works, just mm-hmm. to try to be still. Now, for some people, again, the, the, the monkey chatter of the brain is too much. So it's, can you pay attention to what you're hearing? Can you work with your five senses? Can you be present? Because that's what meditation is about is being present. But can you be present and go through your senses? What am I feeling on my skin right now? Can I be aware of that? What am I hearing? What am I smelling? And for those of us that deal with anxiety and and trauma-induced anxiety, this is a great way of getting out of that anxiety is being present with your senses. I use this often myself when I have anxiety moments is, what am I hearing? What am I feeling? What am I seeing? Name, you know, look at five things in your environment. So there's lots of different ways you can be present and mindful without necessarily having to be still and quiet. You know, I, I encourage people to do walking meditation, which is just trying to be present with your body as it's moving through a particular space. That's a great way to get out in nature. Yeah. Um, you can do guided meditations. You can follow your breath. There can be Um, words that you repeat, mantras you repeat, you can listen to music, whatever it is to help you really be present for just a point in time where you can be still bodily and just breathe and try to let things happen. And, you know, things are going to come up. You just kind of let them go away. Um, And, you know, some days I'm like, oh, this is the greatest meditation I've ever had. And the next day it's like, I wasn't here one minute of that (laughs) meditation. Mm. My brain was in the past and in the future. But it's like anything that you try to build up those neural pathways, right? Repetition is key. And for me, it's the simplest thing is either a guided meditation or just trying to be quiet, follow my breath, be aware of my senses, give myself downtime, really disconnect from all the different devices, try to disconnect from the past and future. You know, we we can get so caught up in our, our childhoods, especially the trauma, we can be so anticipatory of bad things coming in the into the future, really hypersensitive. If we can release those slowly and just try to be present in whatever way you can, whether it's following your different senses, following the breath, whatever, and just give your brain a chance to relax. Because what we're trying to do is train our brains to have a little more equilibrium, equanimity, be a little more settled. So when we go out in the world, we're not so reactive. 
we give ourselves a chance to recognize the situation and say, I have an opportunity to do something different. So instead of those coping mechanisms getting triggered every time, yeah. my brain has been given some space that it can make a decision to do something different. And to yeah, me, that's yeah. what meditation is really powerful for is not only giving you some peace on the cushion, but is giving you the capability to respond differently, more kindly, more gently, more respectfully, more aware and mindful in your life, bringing that into your life to be part of how you're living in the world, even if it's just a, a little bit of space that you can get before you create the storm that you normally would. Can I create some calm instead of a storm? Can I find yeah. that connect with it and recreate that in my connections with other people and connection with myself. That's to me what meditation is building. I don't want to be a perfect meditation person on the cushion. I want to train my mind so that I have a better experience in the world. We always talk about this imagery of the ripples that affect you drop a stone in the in a pond, a still pond and the ripples go away. It's almost like running that imagery in reverse that mm -hmm. you're taking the ripples and you're calming them down, you know, and, and the ripple of calm is what you're trying to get. Because if you engage with your family, your friends, your coworkers from a place of calm and kindness, you know, that's what I tell myself today. I want to be kind to other people and I want to be gentle with myself. That's sort of my mantra for the day. That that's, if I can accomplish nothing else, if I have come from a place of kindness to others and gentleness to myself, no matter what happens, I'm doing the best that I can and that then I've nailed it for the day. Yeah. And it's amazing. If you are kind to other people, you can calm down their, them a little bit and that gets paid forward to other people. You can have a ripple of gentleness, kindness, you know, calmness that you can create simply by bringing that with you wherever you go. And so we have this immense power to influence other people in a really positive way just by being our, our authentic, gentle, kind, compassionate selves. Find yeah. that, however you can uh, connect with that, find that and spread that by being that in your world. That to me is what meditation, yoga, whatever practices you do, that's what I, my goal is, is to find that space and be that space. Well said. When when you actually get to see that ripple happening, it is, mm -hmm. um, it's, it's incredible. Um, yeah. And Be it, prepared it, does. It, it changes, it changes your life. It changes the way you act. It, it does. And there is a challenge with that though. If as, and we, which we should acknowledge for your listeners, you're going to be working hard on yourselves because you see the opportunity to, to get past where you've been. And there's going to be times where that's going to be particularly hard because people who know you, whether it's your family or friends, et cetera, they know the old you. They respond mm -hmm. to the old you. They react to the old you. They're prepared for the old you. And when you show up as a new person, that might be challenging to them, might take them a while to understand and relate to it. And some of those people will not like that. They like who you were, no matter how miserable, unhappy, unhealthy you might have been. There's something about that that works for them. Yes. And well they, said. When, yeah. <laughs> when you show up as your new improved you that you want to be, there's some painful lessons and some painful letting go. And that's the inevitable part of the process. You get to decide now, who do I want in my life? I talk a lot about that in my book. Who do I want in my life? Who is worthy of the new me, who will support the new me. Some people need a little bit of time to adjust. Some people never will. So you have to kind of decide and you get to choose. You know, you, you don't have to just accept or not. And it's hard when it's your family. And if you have to be around your family, you decide how much energy you're going to give to them, how much time you actually give them. But some people just are going to leave your life because they're not going to want to support where you're going, and that's okay. It hurts, it's sad, but in the long run, you want people around you who see that you, believe in you, support you, and you shouldn't waste your energy on people who won't do that. And that's a tough thing for me to say, it's a tough thing to do, but that's a warning for your journey that that's going to happen, but there's also an opportunity that you people who move out of your life 
who aren't good for you, make space for the people who are to enter your life. Incredibly important. Thank you so much for bringing that up. Uh, So many feelings because you are 100% correct. Uh, Yes, there are people that you will have to let go. Um, Yeah. So I would love to um, to ask a little bit about creativity. And there mm-hmm. was um, something that I was really drawn to. You talked about beauty and ugliness uh, mm-hmm. in the section about creativity. And I w- that really resonated uh, with me. And I'd like to talk to just ask you about the role that creativity plays in your life and in your healing process um, and about uh, beauty and, and ugliness and that replacement process. Yeah. So I, I think I mentioned earlier that I was a writer as a kid and I, I drew something a little more than stick figures, but not much beyond that. <laughs> I had a friend who was a true artist and I was like, ah, oh, my stuff never compares. Um, is it so I did, because of that, I never really thought of myself as an artist, even though I was creative. Um, funny how we label ourselves as not yeah. something as much as is something, but yeah. I I really have always felt like I was a creative person Um, and I wasn't one that was creative, like dancing and and that sort of thing, but the writing and the visual arts, um, but that kind of got taken away from me with the abuse. I lost track of that. I lost connection with that for a long time um, outside of what was required for school. And then I think it was when I, was in grad school after I had done some therapy in college and I was in grad school, my dad gave me his old camera and was using black and white film. And I just started going out with it and taking pictures and really got into taking pictures of nature and exploring. I didn't know what I was doing. I didn't know anything about the camera, but I was enjoying it. And I think that connecting that creativity with the nature is really what started to solidify that for me. And then I, when I was in Atlanta and I joined the meditation group, they had a contemplative arts program that was part of the Buddhist tradition there. And I started learning about Ikebana flower arranging and they offered a contemplative photography course. And I'm like, I'm not sure what that is, but it sounds interesting. I like photography. And I absolutely fell in love with it. It was really very complimentary to a meditation practice with your camera, slowing down, being present, connecting directly with the beauty of the world and opening our eyes to all the beauty that can be found even in our daily lives. And that became what my primary practice was that. And I fell in love with it so much. I eventually got certified to teach a couple of different levels of that practice, Mm -hmm. which I've done over the years. And then I got back into writing again. You know, my friend was writing his novel. I was doing what we call novel club, where I get to read a chapter that he'd write, and then we talk about it. And so I got inspired by his efforts to self-publish to try to do something for me. And that's when I started that book I mentioned before, where it was the story of my abuse, where the main character was me as a heroine. But um, I just always liked trying to express something about what I was imagining. I, you know, I was really into fantasy and sci-fi books since I, I, back in the day when they had the mail order book clubs, the science fiction book club, <laughs> I was in fifth grade and I was a member and I would get science fiction books showing up at my door every, every month, you know? Uh, and I loved it. I, I think I love being able to read and, and go out into these worlds that were places that were not my miserable life you know, that I could go and explore and get excited about magic and potential things that were happening. And then that I could bring that and actually create my own worlds that I could write about was, was fun. Um, But there was something about connecting with that again, something that was sort of felt like it was stolen for a while after the abuse that I think everybody's creative in some way, whether it's gardening or cooking or woodworking or the traditional acknowledged visual arts, literary arts, whatever it is, we're all creative. And that is what brings us alive. That is, to me, part of what makes life worth living is that expression. To me, that's an expression of the creativity of the universe, that we have this amazing capability to do that in some way. And to me, obviously, it brings me alive. And to tap into that again after it being dead and and stolen from me, was really important part of my healing. 
that it, again, trying to find a way back to my authentic self and just that feeling of being able to express myself, have a voice to express, um, and it, whether it was written or visual or however it came out. And that was really healing for me to be creative and to express in any way I want. And I love taking art courses to learn new things. I may not ever do that block printing again, but boy, it was fun to learn about it, paper making, whatever. And so to me, it's always, how can I be creative and expressive? And it's not about the end product. It's not about the recognition. It's great to share on social media or whatever, but it's the process of being creative, being in that moment, being that flow, um, whether it's by myself or with groups, it's life. It's bringing life to your life. And I can't imagine it not being expressive in some way going forward because it's just healing and so mm -hmm. critical to, you know, how I live my life now. Yeah. And I loved, um, I loved the way you talked about um, trauma and there being, uh, relating that to ugliness that had been mm -hmm. in your life and about creating beauty and replacing that. So infusing your future and uh, the life that you chose to live moving forward with more and more beauty and creating that and seeking that out. Um, mm -hmm. And I thought that was a really beautiful way to look at it. Um, Cause it's, yeah, I, I think, I think we all get, um, you know, the, the message um, that like creativity, good, you should have creativity. Um, and it's, it's, easy to say and especially if someone is has never been uh you know i if if you're not identified as a creative kid mm -hmm. um you tend to to move away from uh from certain activities and be and say like oh well i'm not good at this i'm not mm -hmm. creative i'm not i'm i i'm a bad at drawing so i'm not going to do it i you know i'm tone deaf so i'm not going to sing um and so you I think that it's really sad how so many so many people are given the message in some way that they're not creative. When I I think all human beings are inherently creative in some way. Mm -hmm. uh, and it just may not be one of those as you say like one of those things that's tagged as creativity. Um Yeah, you know, and so and I try to what works for you. The broadest sweep possible. Like I said anything where you're making something. If you're sewing, you're knitting, you're crocheting, you're being creative. You know, if you're woodworking or building or doing whatever, being creative. And I'm not gender specifying any of that. Anybody can do any of those things. Yeah. You know, whatever showing up for you, cooking, gardening, um, it, you know, just anything you can imagine. If you're sitting down and, and doing the adult coloring books, that's being creative. Yeah. You're, you're bringing your own expression to that. And I, I think that we can move away from needing the label. I try not to use the label artist because that is just so weighted. What I just try to focus on is creative. We have that spark mm -hmm. in us yeah. and it's just nurturing it. And I think we're afraid to not be good enough to be embarrassed, to be compared. You know, and for me, it's like, can you play? Can you be curious? Can you go and try something thinking I may absolutely suck and fail at this by some standard that I might try to give myself, but I'm going to do it because I want to learn about it. And I've gone into art classes where it's turned out I fell in love with it and I learned so much about it. I can teach it now, you know, and, and even if it was it, I do my own thing here that no one else sees, but boy, doing it makes me feel fantastic. That's enough. We don't have to take it beyond that if we don't need, want to. So don't define creativity by someone else's response to what you're doing. Yes. Define it by what your response is to what you're doing. And that's where we can define creativity for ourselves. And even shh, don't tell anybody <laughs> that you're doing it. That's okay. You know, <laughs> you can make Christmas presents for people or you can have a closet full of whatever you made. It doesn't matter. Again, it's the process. It's the expression that it's, mm -hmm. it's acknowledging that there's something that is in you that wants to be expressed and it's okay to do it in a way that makes sense to you yeah. uh, without worry. You know, to me, I just say, can you be curious? That's kind of my new catchword for my approach to the world. It's like, can I be curious about that? Because when things come as a challenge or 
you know, it might frustrate me. It might have all these sort of negative emotions that want to respond to it. I'm trying to rethink it and say, can I be curious about what I'm hearing, what I'm feeling without labeling it? And so you can take that into your creative experience. Can I be curious and explore and give my permission to try things knowing that maybe that's just not a good fit for me, but I never know. I may find my passion by accident because I was willing to explore the possibilities. So don't yes. deny yourself a passion because you haven't tried. Be willing to try it and see. And, and if it doesn't work out like you thought, who cares? On to the next thing that might be just as fun. I 100% agree. And that is curiosity is one of those traits that I hold in extremely high esteem and I think is uh, not nourished and Mm. uh, I mean, oftentimes uh, discouraged and uh, cauterized as we're, as we're children, especially like in you know, those of us who have been through like public education, a lot of us have had experiences like that. Um, and, you got to forget uh, everything public education taught you at this point. It's like, okay, <laughs> kind of put it, whatever they told you, they were lying to you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> just sorry. That was a lot of propaganda. Yeah, it was. Yeah, it was the, a lot of confused uh, stuff happening, you know, and as adults, we could choose. That's what I think is so great to finally be an adult and be able to say, I get Choose what I want in my life, what I, you know, obviously we have to do certain things to get along with other people, blah, blah, blah. But I mean, beyond that basic living stuff, I get to choose how I spend my time, my energy, who I have in my life, and what I do that I find fulfilling and bring, brings me joy. That is one of the big things I say in my book. What brings you joy? Figure it out, yes. find it, keep doing it. Because we denied ourselves for so long and lived in a space of misery, that joy was a foreign language to us. I think to me, healing needs to focus on joy. What is that? Where can we get that? How do I continue to tap into that? How can I give that to myself and yes. rewire my brain? We want a joyful brain. That's what we're <laughs> going yes. for. <laughs> yeah. Oh, 100%. Um, I wanted to also ask you, you talked a lot about partners in your book. And I Mm. love that you talked about partners. You gave a lot of beautiful resources and options for partners to uh, participate, uh, whether it's in joining you for uh, for therapy or reading certain materials. And I love that you discussed, um, yeah, that that they can be a part of it, that it's not just you healing, that if you have a partnership, that they will be involved in, in a certain way, um, you know, because it affects them and Mm -hmm. they affect you and it's, it matters. Your partnership was, it was very present in the book in a really beautiful way. And I was just wondering if you could talk about your partnership and, uh, and how your partner was involved in your healing process. Um, you know, did you go to therapy together? How, what, what was that like? Yeah, I, I was very, very fortunate to to find my husband. Um, funny story about that, too, but um, very fortunate. He's a very sensitive person, thoughtful person, deep thinker. He's What kills me is I'm like going on this path of exploration and thinking and, and trying to make myself a good person. I come with what I feel is a revelation of these deep thoughts, and we're talking, and I'm like, well, poo he's already done this work. He already has been here. You know, he's, he's not overtly meditating. He's not overtly doing yoga. He's not, but he's thinking deeply and has, he's a big old guy. He's a grizzly bear on the outside and a teddy bear on the inside. And when you talk about yin yang, he's more feminine. I'm more masculine. So it works, you know, it it works, but um, just incredibly fortunate to, to find him so caring and sensitive and supportive. He never pushed which was critical for me. Again, we were, you know, so tied up in what other people were thinking about us and their expectations. And he was always supportive. And he would say, you know, he saw how much I enjoyed yoga and how much I got out of it. And he would say sometimes, honey, I, you haven't gone to yoga recently. I know it really makes you feel good. And, and it's really good for you. Do you think maybe you might want to try going to a class again? And I'd be like, oh yeah, I've kind of skipped it. You know, so he'd be really gentle about what he would do. He wouldn't demand I do things. He wouldn't 
tell me what I should be doing, you know, like he had it all figured out. He would pay attention to what I was doing in my healing process and try to find ways to support me in that. We did go to therapy together um, just one brief time when we were um, getting married because we were, were trying to figure out some some things that weren't exactly clicking. And I, when you go to a therapist, you're kind of telling your side of the story. And I wanted her to really be able to talk to him about some of the things, the behaviors between us, because I wanted her to understand the most accurate part of it. I didn't want to drag him in and say, well, he's the problem, you know, because I'm like, I think we need to both be here so you can tell us what's going on. Um, it was a little intimidating for him, right? Because he kind of felt like he was going to get pointed out, but he came and we did a few weeks, months of work together to kind of figure out going into our marriage, how to set things up properly. We had actually, when I was in grad school, um, he had, and I had been together and it didn't work out. I was, you know, not in a healed place. He was going through some rough times career wise. We were both pretty young. Uh, mentally and emotionally, if not physically, both pretty young, and it didn't work out. And then uh, the way life came around, eventually we found ourselves getting together again, more mature, more growth had happened. And we became, the second time around, we became really good friends first. The first time around, it was like fireworks, physicality, attraction, and we didn't really do the groundwork to build a relationship. And that's why it really didn't work when things got tough. But this time, we got to be very good friends. And my parents, when they realized that he and I were going to be getting back together, were distraught. <laughs> like, oh my gosh, you went through this crazy stuff before. And I'm like, when I have something exciting I want to share with something, someone, when I have something really hard I want to share with someone, he's the first person I want to share it with. That to me means that we want to be yeah. together. Now, it wasn't roses and rainbows and puppy dogs. It never is. That's a you know, way relationships are. But I know that he is always going to be supportive of whatever I try to do that I need to try to heal, like this writing this book. He was the first person to bring it up. He was he never forced me to do it, you know, pushed me to do it, but he encouraged me to do it. He was always encouraging and understanding when I'm said I'm not ready. Just he never pushed the boundaries of when I said no. He was always said, okay, I'll meet you there and that's okay, but I'm going to stay here in case you need me to lean on me for that. Um, and so that's kind of been the way that we've worked through things. And, you know, he's appreciative, obviously, of when I'm healing and better and better express myself, feel better about myself, because that brings the energy level of our relationship up and things are easier. Um, mm -hmm. But he supports all my crazy adventures with it art and teaching photography and, you know, whatever I'm trying, he's just like, okay, cool. <laughs> you know, just, just keep doing it. We actually, the funnest thing that we had done together is, and I haven't been able to find something like this since, but we did a couple's yoga class together oh. where they were doing poses. It wasn't, you were doing the same poses. You were doing the poses together. Oh, I know what you're talking about. The, uh, it's not, it's not called acrobatic yoga, is it? But, but yeah, where you're supporting each other. Yeah. And it's not crazy poses. It's some of the basic pose like down dog and things, but it was this, uh, couple, um, a man and woman yoga teachers. And we did this in Atlanta and it was the funnest thing. And we'd be looking around. We had the best time. We were laughing and it wasn't perfect, but we're having a good time. We were looking around at these other couples, some um, same sex, some heterosexual couples. And you could tell the relationship status <laughs> by oh. how they were doing the <laughs> yoga. They were yelling at each other or getting oh, grumpy no. with each other. We'd be like, oh my gosh, they're not having any fun at all. They're not very happy. You know, but that was, we've never been able to find that sense, but that we, we look on that so finally because we had the best time just trying it, you know, again, the curiosity and not being perfect. And if we, yeah. you know, being supportive and cause I'm really flexible, he's really strong. So it was an interesting thing, but that kind of, I think sums it up too, is like entering the world in a space where you're together and your strengths and weaknesses are balanced and you're heading into it with curiosity and exploration and, We've been through a lot in our marriage with challenges with jobs, challenges with health. We got flooded multiple times. I mean, it's Ooh. it's been crazy, but we always come to the point of our mantra is we'll figure it out. We'll figure it out together. We'll get through this together and with the support of family, obviously, but we've got each other's backs. 
And I know that he, now I'm getting teared up here. He was never afraid of what had happened to me. Mm. He was never afraid of that. He was never put off by it, never ashamed of it, never judging it, never, never afraid of what happened to me. And that unconditional acceptance for that gave me the container, the environment, the space to bring that and internalize that for myself. I think that was probably just talking about it out loud is probably the greatest gift that he gave me Yeah, was he, he loved me and accepted me and it didn't matter what someone had done to me. It mattered that he saw the person, he saw the authentic me better and sooner than I saw myself. Hmm. And he empowered me to be able to find her and connect Hmm. with her because he believed in me. He saw that and he was willing to be there until I could do that myself. Beautifully said. I'm thinking. So, so I'm going to have to make him listen to this. <laughs> yes. <laughs> oh my gosh. All the way to the end. You got to listen all the way to the end. So <laughs> all the great things I said about you. And I won't oh, tell them about good. all the things that irritate the crap out of me, but yeah, <laughs> there's that. There's always uh, that in a relationship, you know. But. 100%. Yes. No, <laughs> oh, it's, it's so true. Um, and thank you for for speaking about that because it sounds like you have the relationship that you know everyone seeks and it's very difficult for survivors especially if you're raw mm-hmm. to imagine that they're capable of it there's this mm-hmm. you know the the negative talk there's this belief that because of what's happened to you there's this you're it's unworthy. That you're unworthy. I I won't be capable of a healthy relationship. It's not possible mm-hmm. for me. I'm broken. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm defective. Um, mm-hmm. You know, I'm damaged goods. Um, Who the hell's going to want me? Yeah. Right. You know, and and this this uh, this belief that your baggage, your trauma, uh, is too much. Mm. Uh, you know, too much, and and specifically the wrong kinds. Mm, uh, mm-hmm. and, uh, and it is, you know, there are all these damaging beliefs and messages, um, and ultimately it, they are not true. They are not yeah. true. You can have a healthy relationship. You can have not only a healthy relationship, but a beautiful partnership. Uh, and, but and I question people, I absolutely agree with what you said. I'm, I'm living proof of it. But I caution your listeners, what worked for me was I had to heal and like myself and be okay with who I was before I could get into a relationship that reflected that. Because if I was not healthy, if I was not you know, doing my work, I would be finding unhealthy people that were attracted to me. Mm-hmm. You know? And I gave up for a while. I said, you know what? It doesn't matter. I want love more than anybody on the planet to validate me, but I need to learn to love myself. I need to give myself space. And so I didn't date for a number of years because I just, I knew I couldn't deal with it. I was getting into the wrong kind of relationships. Like I'm tired of being around with this situation. Obviously I need to change some things about myself. Let's focus on myself. And then the good relationship started coming because I was in a place where I could connect with that kind of person. So it's okay if you need the space. Mm-hmm. It's not that you're going to be in alone forever. It's just you need space yes. to heal, to get to a good place so that you can attract and relate to and get into an intimate, physical, emotional relationship with someone who you can trust, who's going to support you. I wasn't very far along it. Well, you know, heck, I wasn't even started in my healing process when I first met my husband, you know, so it doesn't have to happen that way. But what what yeah. I found, and of course, as I mentioned, we were together, it fell apart and then came back. Um, and the, it fell apart because I wasn't healed. And I came, had that space and time to heal. And when he came back, we were in a position that we could have the relationship we had now, but I could never have had this relationship with him before I fully healed. It was not possible for me to show up in that way to be okay in that relationship. So be gentle. Mm -hmm. Again, as always, I say, be gentle, give your space, 
yourself space and time. And then the relationships were fine. I had given up. I'm like, okay, I'm going to be alone. That's okay. I kind of like myself. This is okay space. All of a sudden there was like, oh, hello. Nice guy. Here's a relationship I didn't expect. And that's really nice. You know, so I think it happens. It will happen. But you got to give your, yourself some time to become more of the person you want to be. And then you'll be able to connect with those kind of people who can be that wonderful partner for you um, and, mm-hmm. and who you are attracted to and who is attracted to you will shift. We talked about people have to yes. leave your life sometimes to make room for the people you want to be in your life to show up. There you go. This is that time to, to give yourself space and don't think that there's anything wrong with you that you need some time to heal and to find yourself. That's just part of what we go through so that we can be the better person and and have the right people show up in our lives. Yeah. Sometimes you need periods of time where the relationship that you focus on is your relationship with yourself in order to, you know, reach a point in time where you can make room for having a relationship not only with yourself, but uh, but that, you know, and and making room for having a relationship with someone else. I mean, that's incredibly important. I I do want to say um I I don't I don't want anyone to take uh the the message away that you have to be air quotes completely healed mm-hmm. before mm-hmm. you can have a healthy relationship uh in in your life um because healing is a process and uh and and also there's this uh there's this really damaging uh meme that goes around in in like survivor or uh or like positivity um you know spiritual circles which is um no one no one can love you until you learn to love yourself uh and that especially if you have trauma and you really struggle with self-love there's this you know this this twisted kind of warped understanding of that if I have any problem or I'm still struggling with self-love it means that I'm not worthy or I'm not capable mm-hmm. of um, of other people loving me, um, and it just gets uh, kind of twisted and and you know and and kind of uh, is demonizing to uh, to people who do struggle with uh, with mental health um, mm-hmm. and with certain certain mental health things. And so, you know, just just staying. Yeah, I I just want to say like you can you can still struggle with self love like you can be in process with mm-hmm. that healing journey of mm-hmm. finding that self love uh, and still be working on that and find uh, a, a a beautiful partnership um, and it's, yeah if you're uh, you're taking the possible. steps in the right direction I think that exactly. you're on your way and things start to happen it's when we're you're stagnant or focused on the past that yes you're not going to be able to find it as soon as you you refocus, bring your energy into yourself and where you want to go, let whatever shows up, show up. And then just be, be aware, self-aware to see if what shows up is something that's good for you and supports you and that you brings you joy. You know, you, yeah. you got to start checking in with yourself about these things. You know, we got to yes. be grownups. We got to say, is I got to look at this and self-reflect. Is this good for me? Hell yeah. Okay. Then I'm going for it now. You know, we, we shouldn't deny ourselves things because we're just, like you said, just started on the practice, but we should ask ourselves the, the hard questions to make sure that that's going to continue to support what we're trying to do. And then we have to also acknowledge that we may have someone come in our lives for a short amount of time that was necessary for that season of where we are. And we appreciate that. We can love them in whatever way we do. And sometimes they stay, sometimes they change their relationship with us. Sometimes they go away. So don't feel like everyone that comes into your life, you, it's either life or death, you know, it's like, yeah. they're here, let me enjoy what's happening and appreciate that this person may be my forever soulmate, or they may be my friend for the moment. That is a beautiful thing. And I'm going to just have gratitude for whatever shows up. Yeah. Maybe you have certain things to learn from each other and you're moving in the same direction for a while and then mm-hmm. and then the time will come when you move apart to to find whatever may be in the future for both of you. Yes, that's uh there is there is that focus on on the forever person and uh 
we don't make space for the importance of um of those other relationships they matter yeah and it's okay it's okay if it doesn't last forever yeah i mean if it brings you joy and it, it's good for you that's fine i we have to, i'm such an all or none black or white thinker i have to really be conscious aware of when i'm going into that space and then especially coming out mm-hmm. of the trauma it was totally black or white so we got to loosen up that grip a little bit and say okay it doesn't have to be all or none it can be somewhere in between and that's okay that that's yes. where we need to again, that gentleness towards ourselves. Let's, I love let's practice that. Yeah. that. yeah. Is there anything that you would like to talk about that we haven't talked about? I just wanted to check in. No, I think we've covered quite a bit uh, together. So thank awesome. you so much for all your your wonderful questions and your, your sensitive thoughts uh, around these topics. I really appreciate that. My goodness, you too. I'm, uh, I'm really excited about this episode and I think it's going to help a lot of people. And, and I'm so excited about the book and I think, uh, I think it's going to be an incredible resource that's going to help a lot of people. Um, and my last question is just, uh, do you have anything to say to the survivors that are listening? I'd like to, bring back some of the things that we talked about for sure that it's not your fault what happened and that you can discover for yourself what is going to be your healing journey what is going to support you what's going to help you get started what will support you who can support you and you will find a way step by step little bit by little bit growing into the person that you really want to be and find what you want in your life that brings you joy. So do whatever you need to make it there. Commit to yourself because you deserve that in your life. Thank you. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much for joining me. And uh, and thank you for, for reaching out so that uh, I knew about your book, that I got to read it. It feels like such a gift. And, uh, and I just, I appreciate you and your time and, uh, and all of your beautiful thoughts and, and, uh, contributions. Uh, I'm, I just feel so honored and and blessed to, to get to talk to you. And I just so deeply appreciate you. Thank you. I appreciate you. Um, because I, I really think you have an audience of people that I really want to reach out to and connect with. So uh, the opportunity is, is really fabulous to hopefully inspire some of your mm-hmm. listeners, hopefully many of your listeners. So thank yes. you. Yes. I'm so excited for them to get to meet you and for them to uh to get to read your book. So uh yeah, and and if you're listening, please, please read the book and please review. Authors love yes, reviews. <laughs> review. I'm on Amazon, I'm on Goodreads. Please yes. share the word, spread the word. Your heart is a muscle, the size of your fist. Keep on loving. Keep on pointing and hold on and hold on. Hold on for your life.